So I was greatly inspired by a good, good friend of mine, um, this gentleman here, Venerable Ajahn Brahm, who has visited the Theosophical Society and is coming again this year. I lived with Ajahn Brahm for many years in Thailand and in Australia. We're very good friends. I have tremendous respect for him, and I put great value uh, and weight on what he teaches, mainly because of my personal um, relationship with him, which is one of the requirements for establishing confidence. The Buddha did say that if you want to know somebody's wisdom, you have to live with them, converse with them, uh, for a long time, and then only after you're, you've been very, very circumspect can you establish confidence in either their purity or their wisdom or their character. I feel that confidence in Ajahn Brahm based on my long years of experience of living with him. About 10 years ago, he published a book uh, which I think is an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily valuable book for any serious meditator. This is the Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, a meditator's handbook. Now, there are many books on meditation and many good books. But in this book, Ajahn Brahm, and this was one of his first book, really, uh, is so clear, so explicit in his description of the process of meditation in regards to developing deep concentration and deep insight. It is a gem for the serious meditator. Of course, he is a Buddhist monk. <laughs> and so what he's teaching is based on the Buddhist tradi tradition the Buddhist approach to the spiritual life, to the spiritual practice, and to the culmination of the spiritual practice. So he uses the terminology that is part and parcel of Buddhism. Now, that does not mean that someone from a different tradition um, who is teaching meditation is invalidated in any way. They may use different concepts, different descriptions. They may be also very accurate. But Ajahn Brahm, presenting it from the Buddhist tradition with the Buddhist concepts and terminology, is very precise and clear and speaks from what one can only assume is direct experience because it is profound and quite different than what one may encounter from scholars. Now, having said that much, the Buddhist path or the teachings of the Buddha, what the Buddha put forth, is a path by which human beings, people such as yourselves and myself, can train themselves in order to arrive at enlightenment. That is the purpose of the Buddhist teaching. And he said the way and the path of training that leads to enlightenment is encapsulated in the Eightfold Path. And this is the most important aspect of the Buddhist teaching, really, because it is what he um, gave to humanity. That's his gift. That he became enlightened is great, but you know, how do we do it? <laughs> and so this is the how-to manual. And he said that this is something that must be developed and cultivated each for oneself, that the teacher or the master can merely guide or point. Oneself must undertake the training and arrive at the culmination of the path. These are the eight factors of the path, and of those eight, the last three factors, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, are usually grouped under a training that is called 
uh, training in meditation or training in concentration. It's a practice of developing certain qualities of the mind directly through systematic exercises, systematic training. So these are the core aspects of Buddhist meditation, making an effort to cultivate mindfulness and concentration, but not just any mindfulness and any concentration. It's a certain type for a certain purpose. So often we hear the word mindfulness and it's become quite popular in, in, in the modern times in, in the West. Many different practices of mindfulness greatly, uh, you know, greatly thought, widely thought to be of great help. And it is. But the right mindfulness that the Buddha is talking about and that Ajahn Brah Abraham um, stresses very much is of a particular type. So that mindfulness that the Buddha wants us to cultivate is not just bare awareness, it's not just knowing in an ordinary sense. Um, mindfulness is being um, it, it is being awake, it is being fully conscious, but Mindfulness also guides the awareness to specific areas, remembers the instructions, and initiates a response. So this mindfulness is not just a passive thing. And that's why in the training of the mind, we include right effort in it, because the mindfulness is associated with an effort. It is associated, you're doing, you're, the being present and awake, knowing what has happened, understanding what is happening, knowing how to respond, what to do with that, so that it moves or you move in the direction that you wish to go. So this is a little different than what often is taught as, you know, the idea that just being awake in the present moment is sufficient. It's very good, but you have to also have some understanding and some response. So mindfulness in meditation, or the Buddhist meditation, is very much um, something that is vibrant. It is a presence. It is an awakefulness. But it also in, has an intention, a purpose. And from right mindfulness, we can build on concentration. And this is the concentration that the Buddha spoke about in the Eightfold Path. And what is right concentration? There is the case where a monk, quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful mental qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. And I left that in that formulation without translation. So the Buddha defined here, this was in his first discourse, he defined what right concentration was. And it's still, um, you know, kind of a, a, something that needs clarification because even amongst Buddhist scholars, this is a point that is not completely agreed on that the Buddha really meant that right concentration is jhana practice. Jhana is a Pali word, um, and Pali is a kind of a vernacular form of Sanskrit that may have been spoken in the time of the Buddha around the Ganges Valley. Uh, it wasn't a, um, a written language, it was just spoken. But jhana in Sanskrit is dhyana, which roughly translated in, in English is often, the word used is absorption. Um, let's just say that it's a supra-mundane state of mind that is quite different than any other state of mind that most of us ever experience. So it is a mind that is, you know, highly developed, refined, and purified. 
a consciousness or a conscious state. Often, in, even amongst Buddhists, there is this idea that, you know, you, in meditation you can do vipassana or samatha, and these are the words that are thrown around, like vipassana means insight, samatha means concentration. And even in, in Buddhist schools, quite often, there is this sense of, you know, the, which is the better one. Vipassana obviously is better because it means insight, it means wisdom. The Buddha was enlightened, he had perfect wisdom. We want to be like the Buddha. We don't want to be just like concentrated and calm and peaceful. That's not good enough. That's not, <laughs> that's not much. And it, there is this dismissive attitude amongst many Buddhist practitioners and teachers, which Ajahn Brahm feels is uh, it, it, it's a, due to a misunderstanding, and it is a misrepresentation of what the Buddha taught, because the Buddha was very explicit in what right concentration was. He also was very... Uh, he was actually quite... often, most times anyway, when referring to meditation, he would use the compound, samatha vipassana. It's a compound term, not one or the other. He did not say you practice this or you practice that. Samatha vipassana is a compound term which really means Buddhist meditation, which is concentration and insight. So now, Ajahn Brahm became quite, um, you know, some, you know, he in his own practice, he was exposed to many different teachings, and obviously he, we were disciples of the same teacher. Ajahn Chah never really made so much distinction between these two types of concentration and insight. He always insisted that they go together. Without concentration, there is no insight. Without insight, there is no concentration. They are a pair. However, Ajahn Chah was never so explicit about the necessity for jhana. When asked, uh, how much concentration do you need to be able to have deep insight? He said, enough to do the work. <laughs> he wasn't quite as forthcoming as Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm has become... Um, you know, really explicit in his mind and from his own experience, he makes it very clear that without the experience of jhana, it is almost impossible to arrive at deep insight. And this is because it is only through the power of jhana that the veils of delusion, if you wish, or the hindrances that prevent us from seeing things as they really are. It is only th when the mind has been um, thus purified through jhana are these hindrances sufficiently absent that one can see things as they really are. And these hindrances are what keep us in the state that most of us are in. So, you know, I always ask, why are we not enlightened? <laughs> why are we not enlightened? Uh, and because, you know, it's just, why should I be born ignorant? <laughs> why am I not born enlightened? Uh, enlightened beings are not born. And the, the ignorant beings are born. This, again, is within the Buddhist terminology and worldview, if you wish. But this, these are the words of the Buddha. Often um, in Buddhism... One point to make is that we never point to uh, what the original cause. We never say, this is the reason you are not enlightened. So in dependent origination, the Buddha traces things back. Why is this? Because of that. Why is it? And eventually, you know, why are we born? Because of ignorance. But he doesn't stop there. He also says, why is there ignorance? And it is because... There are amongst these five hindrances which cause blindness, loss of vision, and non-knowledge, which take away one's insight, are associated with pain and do not lead to nibbana or nirvana. Um, 
It is not that they take away one's insight, they prevent the arising of insight. If you've got the insight, then it's not going to be taken away. <laughs> That's a pretty lame translation, but I put it there. <laughs> uh, so these five hindrances, you know, ignorance exists because of these five hindrances. These five hindrances exist because of ignorance. It's which came first, the chicken or the egg. But these are the five hindrances that normally operate um, in our consciousness. And these are things that weaken our ability or make, it, uh, make us unable to see things as they truly are, which is the Buddhist way of saying to realize truth, to realize uh, the reality. And so these are the hindrances that you know, most of us can relate to these qualities. We've all got them at various stages. But in meditation, these are the things that will prevent the mind from moving towards stillness, silence, and clarity. And so right concentration, uh, according to Ajahn Brahm, and uh, consistent with the teachings of the Buddha that we find in the scriptures, the five hindrances are abandoned through jhana. The jhana experience serves the purpose of firmly suppressing the five hindrances for long periods of time after emerging from a jhana. And it is then that deep insight is possible. So, these hindrances are present to a greater or lesser degree most of the time. But that's what we're accustomed to, so that's fine. If they're really strong, if any one of them is really strong, you're going to notice it because you're going to be quite miserable. <laughs> or you're not, very, you're not able to function well. If they're present in a mediocre level, we function all right. That's all. We're functioning all right. But we're not able to penetrate beyond the veils the veil of appearance. And we all suffer from these um, wrong perception. We see that which is impermanent as permanent, that which is not uh, satisfactory as satisfactory, that which is not self as self. And we live from that perception, from those perceptions and those beliefs. That's what we live our lives based on. And that's why there are problems. So we're starting from the wrong perception. To see things as they really are requires that the mind has to, you know, kind of rise up. It's like we're living in, um, you know, under a, a very thick cloud of smog, and we can hardly see our hand, and we want to see clearly you know, the only way to do it is to rise up above that smog, to get way up above it, and we can see clearly. So this process of meditation, Buddhist meditation, according to Ajahn Brahm, and I personally think it's accurate, uh, thus jhana designates Buddhist meditation proper, where the med meditator's mind is stilled of all thought, secluded from all five sense activity, and is radiant with otherworldly bliss. Put blunt bluntly, if it isn't jhana, then it isn't true Buddhist meditation. So he's very, you know, he's very explicit, uh, very bold, very blunt. Uh, it's controversial because even amongst Buddhist meditators, there are varying, various uh, ideas on it. But Ajahn Brahm feels very strongly about this, that uh, we must emphasize the practice of meditation that does establish the mind in jhana so that the mind will be able to realize truth, will be fit for the task of seeing things as they are. So his whole uh, emphasis in teaching meditation, presenting meditation, is 
encouraging people to cultivate a practice that will result in an experience of jhana. This is different than some other teachers. But in so doing, he is also very clear in exactly uh, describing the progression in meditation from ordinary states of consciousness to very refined states of consciousness. He, he describes the path and the experience very clearly, which is rather unusual because many people explain the progress in meditation in a rather fuzzy way <laughs> and, and not quite so clear. So this is interesting to me. It's compelling to me. Not that I will exclude or in any way dismiss someone else's experience, but this is appealing to me. So, the process of meditation according to Ajahn Brahm. In meditation, you let go of the complex world outside in order to reach a powerful peace within. In all types of mysticism and in many spiritual traditions, meditation is the path to a pure and empowered mind. The experience of this pure mind released from the world is incredibly blissful. It is a bliss better than sex. That's his words, not mine. <laughs> the goal of this meditation is beautiful silence, stillness, and clarity of mind. And I think those three words really describe what Buddhist meditation is and what we should be moving towards. Because often we use words like concentration, absorption, uh, or various things that, you know, kind of, well, what is it? <laughs> well, it, it is beautiful silence, stillness, and clarity of mind, and it is blissful. So when, that's the direction we want to go. Are we going in the right direction? Always ask, are we becoming more peaceful? more silent, more still. If we're not, then maybe it's not going in the right direction. So then the actual technique of meditation that Ajahn Brahm teaches um, is, is one of the most um, universal meditation techniques. And the technique is just a tool that you work with in order to cultivate the mind. And he most often teaches mindfulness of breathing. And, you know, that's what we all practice. That's what most of the monks that I lived with and that I know with. We practice a variety of method, meditation methods. The Buddha taught 40 different meditation um, objects, if you wish, techniques. But this was the one that he practiced on the night of his enlightenment. And this was the one that he practiced most consistently and taught most consistently throughout his teaching career. And this is the one that he uh, praised the most amongst all meditation practices. Now, Ajahn Brahm has a slightly different, again, how do you approach mindfulness of breathing? It depends on the teacher. Ajahn Brahm, after many years of uh, teaching experience, as well as his own practical experience, devised a slightly different approach. Whereas he has the first stages of training, he starts off with just present moment awareness, uh, so that you actually don't even start concentrating on the breath in the beginning. And present moment awareness is just establishing your awareness in what is happening in consciousness now, which is actually quite hard to do. <laughs> especially if you don't have a point of reference. And that's why most meditators start with a point of reference from the very beginning. And I still recommend that. Um, but Ajahn Brahm says, present moment awareness is establishing your awareness in the present moment, discarding all thought, concern, uh, preoccupation with anything of the past and everything of the future. Just present moment. What is experienced here now. Whether it's a, a sound or a touch or a thought, but it's here and now. So you consciously put aside concern for the past and concern for the future. You let go 
of these two things. And it is incredibly, um, well, it's an incredible feeling of lightness. You know how much of our thinking is concerned about the past and the future? Just so much of our thinking is actually worthless and meaningless and pointless, but a lot of it is about the past, you know, ruminating or what I did wrong, what went wrong, and always wanting to, you know, we say we're learning from the past. We're not learning much. If we, you know, it doesn't take a lot to learn, but we'd like to go over and over and over, and then we plan and think and, and worry about the future. And, and the mind is going back and forth, and very rarely are we in the present moment awake. So this is a training that one undertakes in meditation, establishing one's mindfulness in the present moment. What is the experience in consciousness here and now? With the instructions on, remember mindfulness remembers the instruction. At this first stage of meditation, the instruction is, Let go of the past. (laughs) Let go of the future. So that's your instruction. Let go of the past. Let go of the future. So you're the the gatekeeper. Mindfulness is operating. The effort is to let go of the past. Let go of the future. Stay here now. Now, personally, I, I like to start, even at this stage, with some gentle reference to the breathing. Not concentrating on the breathing, but just using the breath as my point of reference of what is here and now, because the breath is always right here and now, (laughs) this breath. So I'd like to hold on to the breath gently to help me, you know, notice here and now, and notice when the mind's going somewhere else other than here and now. But that's the first stage, is to discipline and train the mind with gentle effort and mindfulness to remain in the present moment, not getting lost in the past and the future. If we develop that skill, which it's quite hard to do, but gentle, systematic practice, you get better at it. You can remain in the present moment a little longer, a little more easily. Especially in formal meditation is when we want to practice this. The next stage is silent present moment awareness. And in this here, we, as we start to meditate and present moment, you know, starting with just present moment awareness, you notice how, you know, there's a lot of thinking going on. And thinking, you know, not only is it about the past and the future, but thinking itself is imagery and words. <laughs> imagery and words. The commentator is going on. This inner chatter, the inner dialogue, the inner commentator is is incessant. And so as we settle down and have established ourselves in present moment awareness, and we do notice the, the noise in the mind, now is the time to the instructions for our mindfulness at this stage is to Let go of the noise, let go of the commentator, let go of the storytelling, and begin to notice the silence and incline towards the silence. So at this level, abandoning the inner chatter and commentary, you abide in silent awareness, experiencing peace and joy. You should realize that you are much closer to truth when you observe without commentary, when you experience just the silent awareness of the present moment. All that you think is all stuff generated. Whatever you generate is not the truth. If you can, it's just created, conceived. All the, all the conceptions are just creation. So, In the second level or the second stage, again, these are stages indicating a movement towards stillness, silence, peace. So we're removing now the chatter and the discursive tendency of the mind. And 
This happens gradually. When the first time you start meditating, most of the noise is about the past and the future. At this, as you get a little deeper and a little deeper, you find that then the commentator starts spinning stories about meditation and what you're doing and how it's going and what it is and let it go. The instructions to your mindfulness is you hear, let it go. Not fighting it, but letting it go. If we practice this for a long time, and I personally encourage practicing it with gently holding the breath, gently holding the breath, as we become more quiet and more sharp in our present awareness, then you know the mind can actually start to embrace the breath a lot more carefully. This is where Ajahn Brahm starts with mindfulness of breathing, actually. He says you've got to get the mind to this degree of refinement before you really should turn it towards the breath. Fine. Um, it works for him and many others. <laughs> and it's just a slight preference. Uh, I like to start earlier on, but at this level, because the mind is not, you know, it's not running off to other things and it's become quiet, it's malleable. And you can turn your attention into breathing more easily. It's not a tug of war. And the breath is quite prominent. The way you experience the breath is quite clear. So silent, present moment awareness of the breath. So we gave up the past and the future. We gave up, you know, not completely, but we started to really give up the internal uh, commentator. The breath is becoming you know, now quite prominent in consciousness. But in order for us to really, you know, the, to really unify the mind, we need to now choose this at the exclusion of everything else. So that's the process of unification. If we want to go further, then instead of being silently aware of whatever comes into the mind, we choose silent, present, moment awareness of just one thing. Yeah. Choosing to fix one's attention on one thing is letting go of diversity and moving to its opposite, unity. As the mind begins to unify and sustain attention on just one thing, the experience of peace, bliss and power increases significantly. So eventually, whether you're starting with the breath, whether you're going to turn to the attention, you know, eventually you have to collect your attention around one experience. It doesn't have to be the breath. Many people practice using other objects of attention, but it is to move towards a singular unity. So you withdraw your attention, you give up the interest in everything else, you're shutting down, you're withdrawing if you wish, you're going deeply into this one experience. The breath is a very good one to use. Uh, it's natural, it happens by itself, it's completely neutral, it's very peaceful, uh, it's you know something that it's always there, great, but it takes a lot of training and skill. But as one practices regularly, and each one of these stages, Ajahn Brahm says, you know, you may practice this for months, years. <laughs> so this is not something that happens, you know, like in five minutes. Let's do 15 minutes of meditation and get to the first jhana. Not, not quite like that. Um, so with skill and re you know, re repeated regular practice, one can arrive at a more sustained attention on the breathing. So full sustained attention on the breath is what he calls the fourth stage. And the fourth stage is, you know, the, the mind is now not only is it silent and not only is it in the present moment, it's actually quite fully engaging. It's really engaged in this experience of the breath that we know through the sense of touch as it flows in, as it flows out. 
and we're contented to be with it from moment to moment as a process that is happening here now. And it's continuous so that one can sustain attention, not just for, you know, breath, but the experience of deepening, settling, being content with, being fully immersed in, embracing this one experience is the experience of full sustained attention on the breathing. As we do this, um, the breath will begin to become more and more refined. You know, because most of the oxygen that we're taking in and needing is to keep that brain working. When you're sitting down physically still, you're not using much, your muscles don't need very much oxygen, but the brain is a big organ and it needs a lot of oxygen and so you keep, need to keep breathing. If you become really peaceful, really still, really silent, really engaged in this experience, present moments, silent awareness, only on this very experience, the brain activity is greatly diminished, the need for oxygen is greatly diminished, the breathing itself becomes extremely subtle and refined. But in addition to that, the way you perceive the breath changes. The way you perceive the breath changes. And so the breath appears to fade away as the mind focuses instead on what is at the center of the experience of the breath, which is awesome peace, freedom, and bliss. So the way you experience the breath starts to, to change. It's no longer the physical sensation of the breath flowing in and flowing out. And this is something that Ajahn Brahm is very clear on. Uh, and actually, you know, whether it's through the practice of mindfulness of breathing or some other technique, as far as the direction that the meditation has to go, it is always towards this greater stillness, greater silence, greater peace. And eventually, whatever object you started with, it has to end up going towards this experience. So, full sustained attention on what he calls the beautiful breath. When one's full attention rests easily and continuously on the experience of breathing with nothing interrupting the even flow of awareness, the breath calms down. It changes from a coarse, ordinary breath to a very smooth and peaceful, beautiful breath. The mind recognizes this beautiful breath and delights in it. It experiences a deepening of contentment. It is happy just to be watching this beautiful breath, and it does not need to be forced. It is effortless. Even at this stage, the meditation becomes effortless. You're not doing. This whole process is one of letting go. And these once the meditation is effortless, blissful, one can meditate for long periods of time. These are not, that's why two or three hours, yes, they would sit for two or three hours. Now, doing that type of practice, having developed that skill, is already a tremendous achievement. You know, if our meditation practice can come to that, just being so peaceful that we love meditating. We want to, it's just, I sure, I want to, you know, I just want to go and sit. Now, you, don't you want to go and watch a movie? Nah. <laughs> don't you want to go out and, um, you know, go and watch a football game? Nah. <laughs> what about going to see some waterfall? Nah. And this is Ajahn Brahm. This is what he's, definitely this is what he was like. Uh, he says, no, there's nothing more beautiful <laughs> than, you know, your own mind in these states of meditation. You want, this is much more beautiful, much more delightful, much more blissful, much more interesting than all of the other things that you may be able to engage in the sensory world. 
So this is, you know, it's already a wonderful thing because nobody will ever have to force you to meditate. <laughs> and it's not a tug of war. It's blissful. You want to do, you enjoy it. It's a holiday. It's a vacation. Now, when you can do that for long periods and you enjoy, in the, you find joy in your meditation, the stillness, the silence, the peace is deep, reverberating. It's the beautiful breath. It's not a coarse thing. Something amazing starts to happen. So, experiencing the beautiful nimitta. The sixth stage is achieved when one lets go of the body, thought, and the five senses, including awareness of the breath, the physical experience of the breath, so completely that only a beautiful mental sign, a nimitta, remains. For most meditators, this, this disembodied beauty, this mental joy, is perceived as a beautiful light. Some see a white light, some a golden star, some a blue pearl, and so on. But it is not a light. It is the mind consciousness freed for the first time from the world of the five senses. So it is a pure mental experience. It's not related to seeing light. <laughs> now, this sort of nimitta is the word that's used. It means sign. The Buddha said that the mind in its more pristine or original form is radiant, luminous. That is, we don't perceive the luminosity or the radiance is because of the def defilements, the five hindrances. Through the training in meditation, the calming, the stilling, the purity of mindfulness, the peacefulness, the bliss, all that, the hindrances are left behind. They, they're not operating. And so the luminosity of consciousness is perceived. We don't, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something out of this world, okay? It is something out of this world because the world is the five senses. This is outside of the five senses. It is not something you can create. You cannot imagine it. So it's not like visualizing something. It is not something you create. It is something when the, the, the obscuring effects of the hindrances are removed. The radiance, luminosity of that pure mind. It is, if you wish, an image of the pure mind that is not defiled by the hindrances. It appears in retrospect when you try to, when you think about it afterwards and you, wow, what was that? Oh, well, uh, you know, what does it seem like? The perception that you can relate it to, most people are related to light, seeing something beautiful, light. And people see various, you know, slightly different perceptions of light. And the perception of light can occur much earlier in meditation than, than in these deep states. But if it occurs very early in meditation, it's often very unstable, and it flickers, and it comes and goes, and it's not much use. Another thing to say is that as people approach these levels of meditation, it is quite common for people to have some very strange experiences because the mind is now, you know, it is very easily able to access a variety of things. And many people, you know, like they, they, they actually perceive, you know, whether it's disembodied spirits, whether it's different realms, whether it's communicating with certain beings, whether it's receiving instructions. And, and you know, that, that is valid. It's not invalid. Although sometimes, is it imagination or is it actual perception based on something objective? It's difficult to say. But there is validity to those experiences. The important thing is, what do you do with it? And in our world today, 
I mean, of course, there is this fantastic excitement and interest about, you know, this near-death experience and all the things that people see and all the th places that they go and the clairvoyance and all the things that they can do and see and experience and all the mediums and all the things that people that they can communicate with and contact. I'm sure that many of them are authentic. The thing is that so, it's more of the world. That's not what, you know, we're not getting to the end of the world. It's just more of the world. <laughs> more stuff, more talk, more concepts, more teachings, more, uh, you know, creation. So, the nimitta um, is something that arises from a very still, quiet mind. But the form of it is important. And how you use it is important. Whatever comes into the mind in terms of, you know, whether it's an experience, whether it's a seeing something, realm, people, whatever, uh, that's creation. The instructions to mindfulness, let it go. Don't engage. Don't, it's not the purpose. It's not our goal. Unless you want to make that your goal, which is fine. Then you become a, a clairvoyant medium and, and you communicate and do what you do. And that's okay too. But that's not <laughs> what the Buddha wanted. Um, so, the nimitta uh, at the level that Ajahn Brahm says is useful, has these characteristics. Um, it has six features. It appears only after the fifth stage of meditation, after the meditator has been with the beautiful breath for a long time. All that is saying is that one is really well established in deep, peaceful, silent, still mind for long period. It's deep. It's still. There's solidity to it. So in other words, one has laid the foundation for the nimitta to arise, and if it arises, it'll be stable. It appears when the breath disappears. In other words, the nimitta is not a sensory, it's not of the five senses. So the five sense, if your attention is on anything of the five senses, it's not the nimitta. Uh, it comes only when the external five senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, are completely absent. It manifests only in the silent mind when the descriptive thought in a speech is totally absent. It is strange but powerfully attractive. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful, simple object. So those are the characteristic of a nimitta that can take you to the supra state of concentration, which is jhana. So these nimittas, obviously, are they quite wonderful things? Whatever it is you think, uh, whatever you think it is, it's not. So don't even bother about thinking about it. Now, entering jhana. So Ajahn Brahm is now, okay, this is our goal, is to experience jhana. When the nimitta is radiant and stable, then its energy builds up moment by moment. It's like, it is like adding piece upon piece upon piece until the piece becomes huge. And the piece becomes huge, the bliss becomes huge, and the nimitta grows in luminosity. If one can maintain the one-pointedness here by keeping one's focus on the very center of the nimitta, the power will reach to a critical level. One will feel as if the knower is being drawn into the nimitta, that one is falling into the most glorious bliss. Alternatively, one may feel that the nimitta approaches until it envelops the knower, swallowing one up in cosmic ecstasy. One is entering jhana. So this, you know, the nimitta is the doorway. <laughs> The entering into jhana is nobody, you don't enter, you can't do it through will. This whole process is through the process of letting go. The doer, even at this, to enter jhana, the doer has to 
be absent. If there's a doer, you can say the door is just not wide enough. <laughs> if there's a doer, it's no, it won't be jhana. So entering jhana is something that happens when the momentum is sufficient, the momentum of letting go, the momentum of stillness, the momentum of silence, the momentum of joy and bliss in engaging in this extraordinary experience. The qualities of jhana states. Now the Buddha, as I indicated earlier, spoke of four jhanas. First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. In later commentaries, they talk about an addition, additional four jhanas, which the Buddha never called jhana. He called them, um, what did he call them? Immaterial uh, attainment. There are rup- they usually mean non material or at their attainments immaterial attainments, but the Buddha did not use the word jhana for them. He spoke of the four jhanas. And because these jhanas, you know, what are they? They're not of this world. What can you say? Whatever you think, they're not that. <laughs> so what's all the description about them? Well, it's kind of to give you some idea of what it may be like. With all jhanas, the experiences are next to impossible to describe. The higher the jhana, however, the more profound the experience and the more difficult it becomes to describe. These states and their language are remote from the world. A jhana will last a long time. It does not deserve to be called jhana if it lasts only a few minutes. The higher jhanas usually persist for many hours. It is a supra-mundane state of consciousness. Mm-hmm. It is the refinement in the, from first jhana to fourth jhana is all abstract stuff to me <laughs> because it is just a refinement of a super refined state, which is, but even at the first jhana, the hindrances are completely suppressed. They are not in operation. Even before entering the, to enter the jhana, the five hindrances must be inoperative. They are not there. That's why one can enter jhana. But this is a summary of all the jhanas. In any of these jhanas, all right, in any, for starting with the first one, There is no possibility of thought. Now, this is uh, very interesting because most Buddhist scholars talk about the first jhana as having initial and sustained thought or initial and applied thought, which is a complete, uh, you know, this from Ajahn Brahm, that's a complete misrepresentation. He's very clear about it. There there is no thinking. There is no initial and sustained uh, thought. Scholars, most Buddhist scholars, just don't have an experience of jhana. Most Buddhist meditators don't have an experience of jhana. So they don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) But it's easy to translate, and it can be translated in that way. But Ajahn Brahm is quite clear, and I, there is no way that I would dispute this, because even in a deep meditation, if you're really peaceful, you're, there is no discursive thinking. So, in any jhana, there is no possibility of thought. No decision-making process is available. There is no doer who's doing it. So there's no choice, no doing. There is knowing, but no doing. There is no perception of time. Time is all based on perception and and duality. Consciousness is non-dual, making comprehension inaccessible. In the state of jhana, you cannot comprehend anything. (laughs) The process of comprehension is involves a comparison, it involves a duality, it involves a description, it involves a measuring. 
in jhana there is nothing like that. And it is true what the Buddhist teachers say. That's why a lot of, some of them who don't like the practice of jhana say that insight cannot arise in jhana. No, insight cannot arise in jhana. Insight arises when the mind is withdrawn from jhana and it still has the momentum and the purity of the hindrances being absent. So in jhana, no, there is no doing. You don't decide anything. You don't say, I'm thinking I should, this has been really nice. Now I, I better go and have my cup of tea. Uh, no, there, there, it's timeless. There's nobody there. There's no concept of anything other than this bliss and this purity and this singular knowing of just that. Yet one is very, very aware, but only of bliss that doesn't move. The five senses are fully shut off, and only the sixth sense, mind, is in operation. So radiant, luminosity, blissful, knowing of a singular now. Timeless. No man, no woman, no you, no me, no Buddhist, no Christian, no Hindu, no Republican and no Democrat and nobody else and no world and no world of the tomorrow, no world of yesterday, no heaven and no hell and no, none of that, okay? So th that is the experience of jhana. It is out of this world. It is unforgettable. The jhanas are such powerful events that they leave an indelible record in one's memory store. In fact, one will never forget them as long as one lives. They are easy to recall with perfect retention and recollection. The experience is profound. Just the experience of jhana. It is not insight, but the experience of jhana gives you a measure which allows you to see the delusion of our normal perceptions. The first one is the doer, how we identified with the doers for so long. I am the one who is doing, thinking, saying, I decide. And then that I do disappeared. There's a reality without a doer. That is incredible. So, the experience of jhana the, the, is in itself a profound experience. What it enables and what it allows then is seeing things clearly, which is insight. The mind that withdraws from a jhana is powerful. It is something that is fit for the task of seeing things as they really are. So let me just say a little bit more about the jhana. Uh, so people often, the Buddha taught four jhanas. Okay, I'm going over time. One cannot go from jhana to jhana uh, by deciding, oh, now I'm in first jhana, then I'll go in second jhana. There is no concept like that. But it, how one moves through the jhanas is by the momentum that one establishes before entering jhanas. And it's the momentum of letting go. It's just, if you wish, how much momentum have you generated? How much peace? How much bliss? How much present moment awareness? that when you enter the jhana, how deep and how far, how refined will it become? If one is a true master of the jhanas, as some meditation masters are, that's what a meditation master is, one can actually move through the jhanas at will. But one does so by the, what they call the, um, Aditana, or 
the Buddhist way of programming the mind. It's a resolution. So that one who is skilled can, you know, establish the intention that I will meditate and I will then go enter the second. One is quite familiar with the depths and one meditates and enters the second jhana. Stays there for so long and then withdraws. One comes out of the jhana when the fuel of entering ceases. And it ceases either because the momentum was such or because of, if one is a master, because of the predetermined intention. So the Buddha was such a person. He could enter jhana and come out of jhana accordingly. It's like some people can go to sleep and say, I am going to wake up in four hours. They go to sleep. Four hours they wake up. It's just that. I'm going to enter the jhana. Today I'll go into second jhana for, uh, maybe let's say two hours. <laughs> so it, it is possible to do it. But these are extraordinary things. They're not... Uh, you know, we are talking about very, very extremely refined states of mind that are very difficult to experience for most ordinary people. But there are some individuals who can, and we don't know whether we are one such individual or not. So... I have led you on a journey from theory to practice up to the highest or high mountain ranges where lie the great summits of all uh, that are the jhanas. Though the tour may seem way beyond you today, tomorrow you may find yourself well advanced along the route or route. So it is helpful even today to have this roadmap before you. So this was Ajahn's Brahm's intention is to just and you know kind of lay out a very clear systematic uh, guide for people who want to practice meditation from the beginning to very refined states. Due to the limitation of the time of this talk, uh, you know, I only touched briefly on each of these phases. In his book, Mindfulness, Bliss, and Beyond, you know, I do encourage you to look through it. It is, it is a, you know, it's a dense book. There's a lot in there. You don't have to read the whole lot, but it's, there's a lot of really valuable information, especially if you want to practice meditation and uh, want to really understand the direction in which one goes. Now, just to the last thing I want to say is that at the beginning of this talk, I said that the great gift of the Buddha to humanity was the Eightfold Path. Um, he also left the Tenfold Path, which is actually a little ex extension. <laughs> the Eightfold Path, if you remember, and I'm not going to go back to the start, but it was... Uh, you know, it went from right view and right thought and right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Then the Buddha taught the tenfold path from right concentration, which is defined as the jhanas. There comes uh, right insight, samayana, right insight. Insight arises from right insight Sammavimuti, right liberation. What is it we liberated from? All greed, hatred, and delusion. Very light. So the practice of meditation, the importance of the jhanas, is to help remove those veils, to make it possible for us to see things as they are, which is what frees us from ignorance frees us from greed, hatred, and delusion. So 
The description of a jhana, a jhana sounds to me like a description of the mystical experience. Um, and then the second thing that I uh, that com- comes to mind, you you know, you mentioned that we're born in ignorance, and my observation of babies makes me wonder if we aren't born enlightened, and as we engage with the world, we slide back into ignorance. <laughs> Uh, both points well made, and uh, I'll try and answer. Yes, that, that, it is, that is a, a true mystical experience. That is a true mystical. But even, you know, even before jhana, you know, a lot of... See, the, the thing with the term mystical experience, in a lot of things, it fits in there, because a lot of things are, are, are you know, really unusual. Even approaching peaceful meditation and as I said as the deep stillness and silence grows and the peace grows rapture grows so one of the aspects of some mystical experience is rapture if the rapture is associated with sensation it's not very profound then there's the the image the visions you know seeing and hearing and and of a variety of things uh, which can be, you know, it, it is, it's extraordinary. And we can say it is mystical, you know, communing or, uh, with other beings, uh, communicating with other beings in other realms. It is mystical in a way. <laughs> but, you know, it's, so that's part of a mystical experience. You know, perception of light, the nimitta itself, you know, bright root radiance, that's kind of a mystical experience. And these are found in all traditions. People will talk about these. And jhana, although jhana is of a, of a different category in the sense that for the first time, you know, the, the world of the senses completely disappears. There is, there, there is no vision or image or somebody t- or, or feeling something. It, Though the, the five senses completely, the world disappears, the doer disappears is the other extraordinary thing. And there is no comprehension. Now, in other traditions, I, I have no reason to um, think that they don't, haven't had experiences of jhana as well. Um, but I know of a lot of mystical so-called mystical experiences that are more of the cat you know still more of that nimitta and then the visions and then the hearing and then the communicating and then the receiving and and the ecstasy it's still kind of in the of the world <laughs> of the world um jhana is it's a super mundane. It, it is not of the five senses. It is not of the world that of the five senses. Um, so that's. The, but I think mystics or people who are on a spiritual path will have very similar experiences and maybe talk about them in different ways, and also interpret them in different ways. And I've heard many, many people talk, you know, the experience of perception of light and identify that with some divine experience or the soul. And it's an interpretation that fits within that framework. Now, with your other uh, point with regards being born enlightened and maybe then become more uh, ignorant as we... <laughs> uh, I, I, there is a, there is, you know, the, we can see, we say childlike uh, innocence. There is an innocence that you could say uh, in a child, but uh, ignorance is not like, it, the, the, the innocence is not enlightened. Uh, the innocence is not enlightened. It doesn't, um, that's why it, moves towards seeing and, and knowing in the wrong way. Uh, from the Buddhist perspective, um, birth, that there is birth, presupposes ignorance, attachment to being. 
the desire to be an experience is based on ignorance. When there is enlightenment, there is no drive that would result in birth. But this is from the Buddhist perspective. Uh, although each being, each person who is, you know, we talk about human beings anyway, each individual inherits certain, you know, karmic inheritance, which can be very refined, very good or very not so good, but so each individual is different and they carry a karmic inheritance with them. But uh, no, um, no fully enlightened being is born. We do have a question here online. Um, the question is, if a seeker were to entirely abandon skepticism, skepticism, considering it a hindrance, how would he discriminate between a wise and a foolish endeavor, or are we being advised to avoid only excessive skepticism? Yes, that's a difficult word, skepticism, uh, doubt. Uh, and doubt is one of the five hindrances and uh, skeptical doubt, uh, a chronic, chronic doubt that prevents us from doing something, from up, you know, making an effort, making, taking a step beyond, as it were. Um, the Buddha you know, encouraged, um, he did not encourage blind faith or relying on just easily on belief. He encouraged uh, investigation. He encouraged intelligent reasoning, intelligent um, observation in order to be able to make a decision as to the best possible path. But on the other hand, it's true that as if the mind wants to know before it's going to do, <laughs> Uh, eventually you're not going to do anything because <laughs> you haven't had that experience yet. <laughs> so in meditation, you, you get the instructions, you get the you know, explanation from someone. You kind of, you know, do you, have to have, do you have confidence in that someone or that something? Are you going to try it? I mean, you, you don't know yet. You don't know. I'm so, are you going to try it? Okay, mindfulness of breathing, let's do some more. I mean, if you really, you, you've got to be able to suspend this, the chronic doubt, having established a reasonable confidence that this may be useful or this may be good, that this goes in the right direction. You, you're not doing so foolishly. You establish yourself with a reasonable, intelligent, um, investigation of the matter, then you have to be able to do something, actually practice, try, and not try blindly, try, see how it goes, reflect on the result, learn from it so that you can proceed step by step. So skeptical doubt in regards to meditation uh, is one of the big ones for Westerners. Um, and intelligent people, because we like to, you know, we really like to know for sure before I'm going to do that. Uh, and, you know, there is no for sure. People, the faith temperament, the, the, uh, you know, who have very strong devotion, will often find it easier to practice meditation because they're quite willing to just do it. Whereas we do it and we start, maybe, maybe I'm not doing it quite right. Maybe this is not the best technique. Maybe this is not the best approach. Maybe I should try something else. So we do have this propensity to be skeptical in a way that prevents us from applying ourselves. And Ajahn Chow used to say it's like digging a well. You know, you're told that there's water you know, under the ground. So you start digging and well, there's nothing there. <laughs> okay, I'll dig somewhere else. <laughs>
dig another hole, another shovel full, no water. Maybe you have to dig a long way and in one hole. And so that's why, especially with meditation, I tell always I tell people, there is no one best way. There is no magical technique. There is, it's, whatever technique you use, whatever approach you have, eventually you're confronted by your own mind. And so you have to learn how to work with that mind in order to train it. The technique is just a tool. The skill comes from practice and being a good student one who learns from the experience. I'm going to try and combine two questions to make it a little bit easier for you. Um, if you're in a state of non-sensory, when you're in a state of jhana, then how is it that you know when to come out of it, and also how is it that you can remember it if you're not of the senses. With regards, how do you know when to come out of it? Until one is a master, one has mastered this so much that one can actually predetermine. If you predetermine, you can decide when to come out of it ahead of time. In the jhana, you can't make a decision. There is, you cannot decide, now I will come out. There is no... Right. So, one comes out of jhana when the fuel, the momentum that the mind had when it entered jhana wears off. The mind withdraws. And that's all. It's, it's not a decision. There is nobody making that decision. It, it, but it, it happens. And it's related to the momentum of entering the jhana. Now, uh, as to how can you remember it, if it's not of the senses, that's not... The knowing is still very... Actually, the knowing, the experience is far... You know, it's just the reality of that experience is such that it leaves such a tremendous imprint that it's much, much clearer than any other memory in your mind. I mean, it, it, it's like, that's why Ajahn Brahm said it's unforgettable, because it's so, the imprint of it, the, the experience is so enormous in consciousness. It's not of the senses, but there is, a, there is a, the, the knowing of that bliss and that purity. And even though you can't put words to it, you know what it was. So it's not of the world, and it's not of the senses, but you can recollect the experience. So would it be possible to have this experience if you're not on the Eightfold Path and you're not doing the right things? And Could you still get to that level? I think that people do have... I, I, I'm not sure about jhana, uh, but certainly people do, you know, uh, that's what a near-death experience often is, is the perception of this light. Uh, and, I, you know, I, yes, I think people can, even without a systematic training, have so-called mystical experiences. However, uh, you know, with regards jhana, generally the teaching is that without the foundation in moral purity, so that one is not, you know, to be able to let go of the past and the future, even that much, you know, you've got to have a pretty good, <laughs> you know, if, you're, if your mind is, if you've got really things that you have a lot of remorse and regret about, or if you're really worried about, uh, you can't. So to be able to let go of the, you know, the, the distractions of the mind, the preoccupations of the mind, so that the mind can move into a, a, a state like that, usually presupposes a training in, in moral living or living in a way that you're at peace with yourself and the world and able to withdraw easily. And that's why the, the most common way that it happens accidentally is the near-death experience is that some, you know, extraordinary thing happens that the person, you know, who is just, <laughs> you know, 
disengages from normal, normal life because of the trauma. Um, and, and so they experience this extraordinary thing. Um, so it, I would say without undertaking a meditation practice or even anything, you know, tremendously spiritual, I, I think it is quite feasible for people to have mystical experiences of some sort, whether or not they could enter jhana. Most Buddhist people would probably say no, um, because they do kind of the teaching seems to indicate that it does require a foundation of moral and ethical stability, um, clarity. All right. This isn't necessarily meditation related, but um, I've heard many Buddhists make the argument that when you've reached enlightenment, you no longer uh, feel anger, sadness, happiness. Um, I've always had the thought that it doesn't necessarily mean that, that you don't have those things arise, but you're able to not attach and just let them go. I'm just curious where you fall in those two sides of the argument. Um, that is a very, very good question and a very fine line that we're drawing there. So, it is taught by some teachers that, you know, whatever the enlightened person still has ex the same things except that they're not attached. Uh, anger, right? Not attached. So, it's like it's not there. <laughs> Um, it has no power over the mind. That is not quite, you know, that may be a very good practice, and but it is still a practice, you see. You're still, it's something, you know, okay, I want to take it, but I'm not going to take it. It's a choice. It's a practice, and it's a good practice to, you know, the practice of mindfulness and then making right effort to abandon the unwholesome, to develop the wholesome. That's a practice. Enlightenment is, I, is not that, if we take just a, the description in this, uh, in the text, and what I have learned from my teachers. Enlightenment is, um, you see, it's like, you know, the, the, the person, an uh, ordinary person or un, uh, completely uh, an unethical person sees this glass and it's, I want it. And he takes it. The good person sees the glass, he wants it. No, it belongs to the Theosophical Society. They're very poor. <laughs> I better not take it. <laughs> no. Uh, the enlightened person the thought of taking it never arises. Uh, it just doesn't arise. So the Buddha did say that enlightenment was the abandoning, the cutting off, the eradication of greed, hatred, and delusion. The loba, dosa, moha. The, these are the three basic kind of fundamental defilements. The eradication of these. And he, because of that, and because of the perfect view, the mind, it just, you know, there are certain things that just don't arise because they're dependent on those roots for them to arise. So something like fear or anxiety or irritation or anger, uh, you know, they are dependent on those roots in order to arise. So once the roots are cut off, they just don't arise. Um, so this is, you know, like, this is one of the, it's one of the ways to, I guess, establish how, you know, whether the validity and the authenticity of a spiritual person or teacher is, I mean, it's, I don't think that one can live what they know. <laughs> and, you know, there, I just would not, Expect. I do not believe that an enlightened person uh, would be able to do some things. Uh, 
No, and you can't always judge from the external, but certainly I don't think that, a, you know, like a, uh, an enlightened person just can't do some things because some of those external acts do require an internal intention that comes from greed, hatred, and delusion. So anyway, the Buddha, he said, the difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person living in the world is this. The unenlightened person living in the world gets stuck by two spears. One spear is just existence, the sensory world. There is always some discomfort and, and pain and, and comfort, and, and but the sensory world. A lot of times, you know, we're exposed to uh, pain and loss and, and things that don't agree with us. That's, that's natural. An enlightened person also has that. But the second sphere that is optional and that the unenlightened person has thrust into them or thrusts into themselves and the enlightened person that doesn't is all of the mental reaction, which we can call anguish, uh, distress, irritation, anger, lust, uh, jealousy, envy, fear, anxiety, worry, resentment, remorse, and I don't know. <laughs> all of that stuff, the enlightened person doesn't. Why? They still live in the same world, the world of the same, you know, pleasant and unpleasant experience, but the mind, the roots that generate those negative mental states are gone. 